This is a book called President Donald J. Trump, The Son of Man, The Christ. Now, somebody sent me a picture of this book at a Trump rally a while back. Apparently, the guy who wrote it, Helgard Muller, has been going to Trump rallies, passing a copy of his book out to everybody. Let me give you an idea of the premise of the argument here. In the Bible, there are two messianic roles. There's a son of God and the son of man. The son of God was obviously fulfilled by Jesus. He came to earth, died for your sins, and all of that other good stuff, right? The son of man is referred to in the Bible in a number of Old Testament books, the book of Daniel, I think, mentions the Son of Man, the book of Ezekiel, and some others. The Son of Man is supposed to be like a cosmic judge who comes along at the end, sparks Armageddon into existence, and judges all of the good people and the bad people, basically. The assumption is that Jesus is going to come back a second time, take control of the Israeli political system. That's why Israel needs to exist as a nation before Jesus could come back, because that's one of the requirements for the Son of Man, for somebody to be the Son of Man, and then spark Armageddon into place. That's the belief among standard Christianity. This guy's argument, Helgard Muller, is that America is the new Israel, that the Founding Fathers were descendants of the original Jews that came up through the Caucasus Mountains or whatever else. Complete nonsense, just totally made up. And that Trump took control of the political system in New Israel, which made him the son of man. So that is their argument for Trump being the second coming of Jesus. That's what this book is all about, so I wanted to give it a read. We've been reading it already. If you haven't seen the previous parts, don't sweat it. You don't have to see the others to understand what's happening in the current chapter. Do not believe literally a single fact, a single statistic, a single word out of this guy's mouth. Just based on what I've already read, even the most basic facts like the names of political parties or the translation of words are wrong. He lies about them constantly. So before you believe a single thing out of this book, make sure you fact check it. And one more thing before we actually get into the book, some of it can be pretty graphic. The guy is a rabid racist, does not like the black community, grew up in South Africa during the period of segregation called apartheid, and is very obviously an extremely hateful person. So just be aware of that before walking into the book. Without further ado, let's get into it title of this chapter is The Son of God and the Son of Man. He's drawing a distinction between the two, like, messiahs mentioned in the, the Bible. The four gospels in the New Testament speak of two sons, namely the Son of God and the Son of Man. In some of these scriptures, speaking about the Son of Man and the Son of God, you can clearly see the differences between these two. The Christian church unknowingly and knowingly denied that the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in fact referred to two individual deities and therefore made Jesus, who is the Son of God, also the Son of Man. Yeah, so last chapter, if you weren't here for it, we read from this blog post by, an old, by a, a Bible scholar, Old Testament and New Testament. Guy knows what he's talking about. Dude's name's Bart Ehrman. And he talks all about the Son of Man. I may insert a little section in here that explains the difference between the Son of God and the Son of Man from the previous episode, just so that you can cross-reference it. This is a nine-minute clip from the previous chapter. If you've already heard this, skip to 13 minutes and 17 seconds. Let's take a look at Bart Ehrman's assessment of this, because it, I, think, I feel like it's time to look at a biblical scholar's view on the Son of Man and what Jesus meant when he said this thing or that thing, okay? Bart Ehrman is a famous Bible scholar. He has a PhD in the field. He can speak Hebrew fluently, like old Hebrew, seriously. He knows what he's talking about, okay? And he wrote this whole section on Jesus and the Son of Man, this whole bit on his website. So let's just read this article to get a little bit of context so we can figure out if Jesus believed himself to be the Son of Man or not. Here's the question that was asked of Bart Ehrman. Two weeks ago, I started addressing a question I got asked to the blog. At first, I was just going to reply to the question as a comment. As my response started getting a bit long, I decided I better devote an entire post to it. When I started working on a post on in, I decided it needed to be a thread. As I pointed out, that was two weeks ago, and I still haven't answered the question. 
I'll answer it here rather briefly based on the information I've got. The answer should make sense on its own terms, but if you want to see the reasoning behind it, read the posts over the past couple of weeks that have been about the Son of Man. Here's the question. In Mark 8, 27 to 28, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? This is also a reference to the section we read in Matthew. And they reply that different people think he's John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. Jesus then follows up with the key question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ. When Luke tells this story, Luke keeps the verbal back and forth almost the same. Although when Peter replies, he's a bit more specific, the Christ of God. Was there any other kind of Christ? Matthew's version is a bit different, though. Jesus asks, who do people say the Son of Man is? So the Gospels are four different accounts of the same story, basically. Mark came first, and I could be wrong, but I believe Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source and rewrote and added some things. And then John came, like, way later and just added all kinds of stuff, stories that weren't related to anything at all and objectively did not actually happen. Like that story about he who cast the first stone or he who's without sin should cast the first stone. That's fake. That never happened. That's a a fabricated story in the book of John that doesn't exist. So anyways, Mark is widely considered to be the most accurate gospel account because it was the earliest and the first and we have the most copies of it that are the most cohesive and connected to each other with as few discrepancies as possible. That's probably why he's using Mark as a reference here rather than Matthew, but uh, let's keep reading what Bart Ehrman had to say on this subject. Matthew's version's a bit different, though. Jesus asks, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples are playing the same way, although in addition to John the Baptist and Elijah, they also say that some people think he's Jeremiah. And Jesus replies again, but who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Matthew adds more at that point. He's saying Matthew adds additional stuff that was not found in the originals or in the book of Mark, thus kind of implying that maybe it doesn't belong there. So is Matthew having Jesus ask two different questions? Who is the son of man and who am I? Or is Matthew trying to have Jesus refer to himself in this passage as the son of man? In fact, is Matthew equating Jesus, the Son of Man, and the Son of God as all the same person in this passage? Or is he differentiating between Jesus and the Son of Man? He obviously tweaks the passage for some purpose. So here's Bart Emmons' response to the question. Jesus did use the term Son of Man as a central part of his message. In doing so, he's referring to a cosmic judge of the earth who would come at the end of history to bring a cataclysmic end to the world as we know it, to destroy all the evil forces in the world that are opposed to God and that are making life miserable for his people. After this day of judgment, the Son of Man would bring in a new kingdom on earth, a utopian kingdom of God. The ultimate root for this view of the coming of the Son of Man lies in a passage in the Hebrew Bible, Daniel 7, 13 to 14, one of the earliest apocalyptic passages we have out of ancient Judaism. Different Jewish teachers in Jesus' time understood the passage differently, and various ones of them had differently nuanced understandings of who this one like a son of man was. Jesus' view was distinctive but not entirely unique. Others, too, thought the son of man as the cosmic judge of the earth. To show this was Jesus' view requires an in-depth study of the way he uses the phrase in the New Testament Gospels, since he uses it in a variety of ways, and one has to determine which of these sayings about the Son of Man actually go back to Jesus himself, just as we have to determine at every point which of Jesus' sayings are his, and which have been put on his lips by later storytellers after his death, passing along the traditions about him. Really interesting blog post. Bart Ehrman is absolutely fascinating, in my opinion. So here is another set of bullet points. There are several remaining fundamental points here. I want to make sure that we have a full and complete understanding of a biblical scholar's understanding of the Son of Man and why Jesus believed that he was the Son of Man. So let's read the rest of this. We're almost done with it. After his death, Jesus' followers believed that he'd been raised from the dead and exalted to heaven. They also thought that Jesus was the Messiah who'd been sent from God in fulfillment of prophecy. But the prophecies about the Messiah in the Jewish tradition were entirely about his exerting the power of God to destroy his enemies and rule as king over the nation of Israel. 
that's a key component of the son of man that he's going to take control of Israel as a political leader and then destroy his enemies and rule as king, basically. Jesus obviously never did that. On the contrary, he was a virtual unknown in his day, a rural preacher who offended the ruling authorities, was arrested, tried, condemned, publicly tortured and humiliated, and then executed for crimes against the state. His followers could plausibly maintain that he was the Messiah only by insisting that he was coming a second time in glory to fulfill the prophecies of the Messiah who would destroy his enemies. Jesus was coming again from heaven to judge the earth in power. Okay, so it, I, I'm picking up that the belief is that there was only one messianic role at the time when Jesus was on earth the Messiah, and the Messiah included the Son of God and the Son of Man. It, it included both messianic roles. Not until Jesus didn't fulfill the role that they believed that he had to fulfill to be the Messiah did they split it into two pieces. That's what I'm picking up from this. Jesus was coming again from heaven to judge the earth in power. Jesus then, in the views of his followers after his death, was himself the coming son of man. And so they came to believe that when he had spoken of the son of man, he was speaking about himself. They adjusted his sayings about the son of man accordingly and put sayings on his lips in which he described himself as the son of man. That's the basic breakdown. I hope that makes sense. There's a little bit more to this blog post, so let's keep reading. We're almost done here. That is why you have the conversation recorded above in the passage of Matthew expressed the way it is. In the older version, Mark, again, Mark was the first gospel written, and Matthew based its writings off of Mark or off of a similar writing. In the older version, Mark, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And when he replies, he follows up with, and who do you say that I am? Matthew, who used Mark's version as his source, there you go, altered the conversation slightly so there can be no question about Jesus' identity. He first asks, who do people say the Son of Man is? This is a clear self-reference here, i.e. in Matthew's version, He's changed Mark's wording. When the disciples reply, he responds, and who do you say that I am? Matthew has phrased the conversation in such a way that it's obvious to the reader that Jesus himself is the Son of Man. In that way, in every other place where Jesus refers to the Son of Man, everyone will understand that he's talking about himself. Mark would have agreed that Jesus is the Son of Man as did all the other Gospels. Mark simply did not make the matter as explicit as Matthew chose to do. It was not, though, the view of Jesus himself. It was actually quite contrary to his view. Wow, fascinating. Everything about the historical Jesus is complicated for historians to resolve. Very few things are as intricate and complicated as this. So hopefully that gives some insight and context into who the Son of Man is, why people believed it was Jesus, so on and so forth. Jesus did not seem to believe himself to be the Son of Man, but his disciples after he died absolutely did believe he's the Son of Man. And everything following the Gospels pointed to Jesus being the Son of Man. Okay, back to chapter 2 of this book. So that's what we came to understand from the previous chapter. There is no fundamental distinction between the Son of God and the Son of Man in the Bible. There's just a single Messiah that came along, and they believed that Jesus was that Messiah. Simple as that. But this guy needs that distinction to exist so that Donald Trump can be the second Messiah. These lies that we've been told over two millennia that Jesus, who is the Son of God, is also the Son of Man, have made us unaware and destined away from the truth. Yeah, he's also from South Africa, so he doesn't speak English in a way that... Americans speak English, not trashing on the guy. I, he's just not as familiar with the English language as others is all. And that's okay. He's just, it's really hard to make it through the book sometimes because of it. The greatest distinction between the Son of God and the Son of Man is that the Son of God, which is Jesus, cannot come with the angels of heaven, but the Son of Man can come with the angels of heaven. Uh, okay, I don't know where he's picking that up. Jesus, who is the Son of God, said that he cannot come with the angels of heaven in Matthew 26, 53, and 54. 
but claims that the Son of Man will come with the angels of heaven, according to Matthew 13, 41, Matthew 16, 27, Matthew 25, 31, Mark 8, 38, and so on and so forth. Let's just take a quick look at the a couple of these verses. I just want to look at one or two because I, I really don't trust a word out of this guy's mouth. Matthew 26, 53 and 54. Let's just see what that says. So his claim is that this verse says Jesus cannot come with the angels of heaven. Here's what 53 and 54 say. It's in red, so Jesus is speaking it. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Okay, Jesus wasn't saying that he can't come with angels. He was saying, don't you think if I called on my father that he would blah, blah, blah? What is this guy even talking about? He's using a verse that's saying something completely different to establish a premise for some argument. That's ridiculous. But that that's the whole premise of this book. That's what it's all about. The guy just makes things up, makes claims about things, and states it as fact and refers back to the things that he said previously to establish those facts. Complete nonsense. The Son of Man will come with the clouds of heaven, according to Daniel 7.13, Matthew 24, 30, so on and so forth. Yeah, we've already disproven like his claim here, so not even going to bother with that. Oh, and I guess he quotes some Bible verses. He actually quotes the Bible verses that we just read. Another critical piece of evidence that Jesus gave, that wasn't a piece of evidence that Jesus believed that Donald Trump was a son of man. You're not convincing me here. Another critical piece of evidence that Jesus gave is that the son of man will come on the fourth day or the fourth period which is written in Matthew 12, 38 to 42. Jesus is the son of God and his number is three or the third day as we know it. What? What is he talking about here? Let's just look this one up and see what it says here. The sign of Jonah is the name of this subtitle or, or subsection or whatever. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what Jesus is saying here is the prophet. That's what he's referring to here, the prophet of God. He says Jesus is the Son of God and his number is three, or the third day as we know. No, he was referring to Jonah and the whale. What is this guy even talking about? He says he thinks there have been like two prophets before Jesus or two messiahs before Jesus. What? That is not what it's about at all. The entire Bible is written in a mythological code and it is filled with encrypted hidden secrets throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus made sure that his followers understood that he who is the son of God is the third day, according to Matthew 16, 21. No, no to all of that. He was referring to Jonah and the whale in that section. But just for good measure, let's look up this next verse that he cited here, Matthew 16, 21. I want to be as good faith about this as possible. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That says nothing about Jesus being like the third prophet or whatever he was claiming here. It's completely made up. So he, basically what he's doing is he's using like some kind of secretive numerology, some weird number system to establish the idea that Jesus believed that he was the third prophet. And he is establishing that by listing every verse where Jesus says the number three. It's ridiculous. Jesus said that he's the son of God who is the third day and the son of man is the fourth day, according to Matthew 12, 38 to 42. No, we just read that. It's made up. He was talking about Jonah and the whale. Jesus gave three signs in Matthew 12, 38 to 42, that the Son of Man will come on the fourth day, and that Jesus, who is the Son of God, who was crucified and rose from the dead on the third day, is in fact the third day. The three signs in Matthew 12, 38 to 42 are all about the number four. Jonah came out of the belly of the fish on the fourth day. The Son of Man will appear on the fourth day from the heart of the earth. The king 
And King Solomon was the fourth son born to King David in Jerusalem, according to First Chronicles three five and Second Samuel five and Second Samuel five fourteen. Yeah, I've seen this kind of thing before. This whole numerology thing, this Bible numerology thing, or whatever. Ken Tovind is a huge fan of doing this too. He'll take the the fifth verse of the second chapter of every book in the Bible and take the second letter out of each of those verses and line them all up. And if you spell it out exactly right, it says. Hitler will die in a bunker in 1940, blah, blah, blah. It's like the healing crystals of the Christian world. Everybody else realizes completely made up and it's nonsense. So he's going through the Bible and finding every time Jesus referred to the number three, every time he does things three times or whatever else, or four times, and he's using this to establish the idea that he was the third prophet. I don't know who the previous two were. And Trump is the fourth prophet or the son of man. Completely made up. This is also known as Bible code, I believe. There's a name for this, Bible code. And like I said, Kent Hovind is a huge fan of it. All right, let's keep reading. The three signs which Jesus gave to the scribes and the Pharisees is all about the number four when the Son of Man will come and not about the number three and therefore has no connection to Jesus himself, who is the Son of God. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth is exactly 72 hours, and three days and three nights in the belly of a fish is exactly 72 hours. The sign of Jonah that was given for the sign of the Son of Man is all about the fourth day. King Solomon is the fourth child born to King David in Jerusalem, and this only confirms that these signs are all connected to the Son of Man that will come on the fourth day and has nothing to do with the number three or to the Son of God as the Christian church claims it to be in their own crooked narrative. Wow. Okay. That was a conspiracy to end all conspiracies. That was insane, dude. That was just like eating himself alive with conspiracy theories. He's just finding every instance of Jesus doing something three times or four times and using those things as evidence that Trump is the Messiah. That is nuts. That is straight up nuts. Oh, okay. I guess the next section is just him quoting the Bible. Um, again, I'm not reading his quotes here. I'm going to look it up myself. Wow, he's just kind of jumping around. All right, he quotes Chronicles three five. Let's read it on a on like the NI. Let's read it on the NIV website instead of his book because I don't trust his book to quote it correctly for obvious reasons. And these were the children born to him there. Shamua, Shabab, Nathan, and Solomon. These four were by Bathsheba, daughter of Amiel. So I guess he's trying to establish that there were four children or whatever. He's just establishing the stuff that he said previously, which is complete nonsense anyway. So I don't know why he even wants to bother establishing it. He's just referencing any time the Bible mentions three or four items in one place and claiming this is proof that Trump is the Messiah. This is Second Samuel 5.14, and these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shamua, Shabab, and Nathan, and Solomon. Okay, there were four people in that list. Who? What does that have to do with Trump being the Messiah? Nothing. And then he reads Matthew 12.38-42, which we already read. It was just Jesus basically saying, he was telling a story about Jonah and the whale. This does not establish his point. Another great difference between the Son of God and the Son of Man is that Jesus, who is the Son of God, is the bridegroom for the men, according to Matthew 9, 14 to 17 and some other gospel verses, whereas the Son of Man is the bridegroom for women, according to Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Please read my chapter, The Two Bridegrooms, to see the differences between these two bridegrooms in my book, The Five Gods of the Bible. Uh, no, I'm not reading your terrible book, The Five Gods of the Bible. I'm struggling to get through this one, but it's important, so we will get through it anyway. Note that Solomon was the one who led Israel away from God and toward idols. Pretty sure that's a bad thing if there really is a connection, right? <laughs> Yeah, none of that matters in this guy's head. What matters is propagandizing and finding some weird, bizarre, twisted way to get to the conclusion that Trump is the Messiah. Jesus compares the Son of Man to King Solomon, according to Matthew twelve thirty-eight to 42. Okay, I didn't get that. For King Solomon had his own harem full of women, according to Kings 11, 1 to 6, and Ecclesiastes 2, 8. It feels like what this guy is doing right now is exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses do, which is they pick out like six verses from all across the Bible. You know, a verse from the book of Numbers, 
a verse from the book of Daniel and one from the book of Revelation and one from Matthew. So four verses, and they kind of mash them all together and read them side by side. And if you read those four different verses from four different books side by side, you could be given the impression that God sent Jesus back to earth in 1914 to forgive everybody and take control and blah, 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 blah. But that's not how the Bible was written. That's not how it was intended to be read. It's They're completely separate books written by different authors at different time periods, have nothing to do with each other. That's what he's doing right now. He's kind of mashing books and verses together and reading them side by side to give people a very specific impression. It's nonsense. It's It's basically creating a new book out of the previous four. Jesus, who is the Son of God, made a very interesting statement that the Sabbath belongs to the Son of Man, according to Matthew 12, 8, and not the Son of God. All right, so every time he quotes a Bible verse, he quotes like every other Bible, or he quotes every other gospel verse that mentions it. So if you were unaware, the gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Those four books, and they are telling the exact same story four different ways. Seriously, it's the exact same story. Matthew used Mark as a source, and Luke did too, I believe. So Mark was the original, and as far as I'm concerned, Mark is the only one that we should ever refer back to for that reason, since it was the original. But every time he quotes a Bible verse, he quotes the other Gospels along with it, like he quoted Matthew, Mark, and Luke here, but not John, weirdly. So instead of listing all of the Bible verses that he quotes here i'm just going to give you the first one i'm assuming that you're not like doing the hard research along with him and if you really do want to do the hard research along with him you can just get the book and read it yourself because it's entirely too many verses to like quote and read every 15 seconds so anyway let's keep reading the sabbath does not belong to jesus who is the son of god but it belongs to the son of man in my other chapter the two gods at the sabbath i have explained in detail the two gods present at the sabbath in my book the five gods of the bible yeah i'm not reading your book the five gods of the bible i'm sorry man luke 6 5 is a verse he quotes here and jesus son of god said unto them that the son of man is lord also of the sabbath Okay, I get the impression he misquoted this verse. I'm not convinced this is what it says. Let's look this one up. Luke 6, 5. Huh, interesting. Notice it says, Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. It does not have the words Son of God anywhere in the verse. Isn't that interesting? He added that to give you the impression that he is correct. He should have ended the quote right here. Quote, And Jesus, end quote, comma, who I believe to be the Son of God rather than the Son of Man, comma, open quote, said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord, blah, blah, blah. This is a direct example of him manipulating or changing scripture to look a little bit closer to what he thinks it should say rather than what it actually does say. Fascinating, right? There are several differences between the Son of God and the Son of Man. One thing which stands out is that Jesus, who is the Son of God, speaks in John 15, 1 to 8 about the grape farmer. Jesus, the Son of God, is the grape farmer, and the Son of Man is the sower of wheat, according to Matthew 13, 1 to 43. Yeah, so what he's doing here is he's playing off of the difference between the Gospels. The Gospel of John is the least accurate and the most removed from the situation. So the book of John didn't come around until way later. It's a younger gospel. It was a gospel that was written after all of the rest. It was based off of the other gospels, too. It used the book of Mark as a source, not the original information that Mark used, but It used Mark itself, and it adds stuff to the stories. Like, for example, it added the story about Jesus saying, he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's completely made up. That never happened. We know that without a shadow of a doubt. That is just one example of the book of John adding stories to itself that didn't actually happen. The writer of the book of John also was under the impression that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit were one. That is not a sentiment that Jesus or the other gospel writers believed. The kind of in a Trinitarian kind of idea. The others did not see it that way. John was the first one to come along 
hundreds of years later and espoused that idea. And that's where Trinitarianism came from. So there are like one or two verses maybe in the book of John that kind of lightly hint at it a little bit. Like, for example, it says in the beginning, the word, wait, what was it? it it's John 1.1. 1, 1. I don't even remember what it says exactly now. In the beginning th was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, they put that in the book of John very specifically to intentionally give people the impression that the Trinity was real when there's honestly no reason to believe that nobody else believed it up to that point. So the dude is, it seems like he's playing off of the differences between the book of John and the other gospels. That's not going to fly with me because I roughly know the history of this stuff and I'm not going to be suckered by this cheap game that he's playing. So let's keep reading here. Jesus, the son of God, is the grape farmer, and the son of man is the sower of wheat, according to Matthew 13, 1 to 43. Comparing the son of man, who is the sower of wheat, according to Matthew 13, 37, with the son of God, who is the true vine, according to John 5, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, according to John 15, 5, you can clearly perceive the distinction between these two sons. Uh, now it's just quoting John fifteen five. Yeah, like I said, I found just one example of him twisting the Bible verse around to add words to it that weren't there originally. So I'm not even going to read his rendition of the Bible verses. I don't care. Another great difference between the Son of God and the Son of Man is that the Son of Man will be buried in the earth, according to Matthew twelve thirty eight to forty, and that the Son of God was buried in a tomb, according to Matthew twenty seven fifty seven two sixty one. Let's take a look at that one, 1238 to 40, because I don't remember that. The claim that the son, that the, the Messiah will be buried on earth, 1238 to 40. Okay, here's Matt. Wait, just trying to turn a fucking page. I always saw old people lick their fingers and then turn the page of the Bible. I was like, oh, that's fucking disgusting. Who the fuck would do something like that? Now I know. Now I know. People with very dry hands. Okay, let's see. Matthew 12, 38 to 40. This is the sign of Jonah is this, this little section here. And it's in red, so it's Jesus talking in a minute. Not quite yet. Verse 39 is Jesus talking. So we're on 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Here's 39. This is Jesus speaking now. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the end of 40. Okay, so this guy claims... Oh, wow, this is really interesting. Really process how this guy is twisting things around to fit the narrative that he wants it to fit, okay? So his claim is that the Son of God... Here's a difference between the Son of Man and the Son of God. The difference between the Son of God and the Son of Man is that the Son of Man will be buried in the earth, according to Matthew 12, 38 to 40, and that the Son of God was buried in a tomb, according to Matthew 27, 57 to 61. So he's trying to claim that Jesus wasn't the Son of Man over a semantic difference. It says the Son of God will be buried in a tomb, and the Son of Man will be buried in the earth. Is there really a fundamental difference? The point is he's going to be buried. He's going to die, and then he's going to be resurrected after three days. That was the point the Bible was making. These are the little linguistic tricks that the guy is using. Linguistic tricks lead to nonsense when you're reading a book that was written in a different language in the first place. That was written 2,000 years ago in a different language. Like, give me a break. This is a prime example of this guy being manipulative to try to get his point across. The Son of Man will come on the fourth day from out of the heart of the earth, according to Matthew 12, 38 to 42. No, that verse that we just read was about Jonah and the whale. Did I miss something? 38 to 42. Let me look it up one more time, just to be sure. I want to be good faith about this. Okay, so we just read verse 40. Let's read verse 41 to 42. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with his generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with his generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. And what is his claim? The son of man will come on the fourth day from out of the heart of the earth, according to Matthew 12, 38 to 42. No. No. 
No, it does not say that anywhere through this entire Bible. No, that's completely made up. Whereas the Son of God was resurrected on the third day and came out of the tomb, according to Matthew 16, 21 and 27 to 60. Yeah, it's just made up. It's just completely fabricated. The Bible does not say that at all. He's not only is he twisting the Bible around to say what he wants it to say in certain parts and adding words to it. He's just claiming that it says things it simply doesn't say. Jesus made an astonishing statement when he said that he is not the son of man, but he is the son of God, according to Matthew 16, 13 to 20. You want to bet he didn't actually say that? Let's look that one up. Matthew 16, 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Oh, yeah. I talked about this earlier. Like I said, I inserted a little clip from the previous episode from chapter one to kind of explain the whole son of man thing and what it meant and what Jesus meant by it and all that other stuff. So, yeah, um, I feel comfortable saying that this is totally discredited. Jesus made an astonishing statement when he said he is not the son of man. That's not what happened. That's a complete misrepresentation of what happened. Jesus heard that the men were calling him the son of man, according to Matthew 16, 13. But there's only uh, but there was only Peter who knew the truth that Jesus is the son of God, according to Matthew 16, 16, and not the son of man. That is not what happened at all. Again, according to Bart Ehrman, this section in Matthew was added after the fact. Matthew used Mark as a source and added information, added verses, added stories to it to change the meaning behind it a little bit. Like I said, I put the clip in the beginning, so this should be pretty clear about the little trick that he's playing here. It is essential that you divide these two sons from one another to see and recognize their full separate identities for these two sons are not the same person. God, I hope he gets to how he determined that Trump is the son of man eventually. There are quite a few verses in which Jesus referred to the Son of Man as a separate entity that will make you think twice and realize Jesus is not at all the Son of Man as the Christian church claims that he is. Jesus is the Son of God. In most verses, Jesus referred to the Son of Man as somebody else in the third person. Yeah, he's just completely twisting this around. That is incorrect, as we saw earlier. Certain scriptures are very dominant to state the fact that the Son of Man is not Jesus at all. For instance, Mark 8.38 and Luke 12.8 and 9 are great examples where Jesus is speaking about himself in the first person, and then he refers to the Son of Man in the third person. Mark 8.38? Let's just look that one up real quick. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Interesting. Let's look this one up in the interlinear. Whoever for if may be ashamed of me and my words in the generation, this adulterous and sinful, also the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he shall come in the glory of the Father of him with the angels. Holy. Okay. So this verse is in Mark 8. I'm not sure who Jesus was talking to leading up to this. It's possible he's talking to the Pharisees or something, somebody that he didn't want to know that he believed that he was the Messiah yet. So in in chapter 8 of Mark, here are the subheadings, the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Jesus heals a blind man at Bethsaida, or Bethsaida, I'm sorry. He heals a blind man at Bethsaida. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah Who do people say that I am? He says, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, so on and so forth. Then Jesus predicts his death. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, so on and so forth. So up to this point, Jesus was having a private conversation with his disciples. And then in verse 34, it says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. So he's addressing a crowd of people that are not necessarily favorable to him. So he is changing his language to be something a little bit more soft and a little less on the line and obvious that he believes that he is the Messiah. He's changing his language to appeal to the crowd that he's speaking with rather than to his disciples. And in in verse 38, he says to the crowd, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So Jesus was using a light touch, implying to this crowd 
that was not as favorable to him that he was the son of man. And Helgard Muller, Donald Trump's enforcer who's trying to convince everybody that Trump is the son of man, is twisting it around to make it seem like Jesus was claiming that the son of man was another Messiah, not himself. All right, let's keep reading here. When you study the Torah, you will see that the third time on the Mount, uh, I'm sorry, that the third time on Mount Horeb represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the third time at Mount Horeb, you can clearly see that Moses wrote about the character of Jesus, the son of God. Moses was not a real person. It's historically established that Moses was pretend, but that's neither here nor there. Jesus himself testified in John 5:46 that Moses wrote about him, and you can clearly see the prophecy of Jesus written in Exodus 24:3 to Exodus 33:17. Okay, I, I, hard doubt on that one, but I'm not going to get hung up on it. Let's keep reading. The Son of God, which was crucified according to John 19:18, represents the tablets of stone which were made and written by God, which were also crushed and destroyed at the foot of Mount Horeb, according to Exodus 31:18 and Exodus 32, 15 to 19. Wow. So he's drawing a parallel between Jesus and the tablets, apparently. Bizarre. No reason to draw that parallel at all, but okay. After the first tablets of stone made by God were broken, there was a second set of tablets of stone, according to Exodus 34, 1 to 4, made by man, Moses, and not God this time. Is that true? Did God personally, physically write the first set of tablets and then Moses went back up and forged the uh, the second copy? I don't remember that being from the Bible. Maybe, maybe. I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't remember that part though. So he's using this, ver- this set of verses from the book of Exodus as a pretext to believe that there is a second Messiah coming. So the first set of commandments that Moses walked off the mount with fell and broke. He went back up, had a second set made, and brought those down. And he's drawing a parallel to Jesus. So Jesus died. I guess Moses went up and got a second Jesus. That's kind of the idea here. This makes no sense at all. This does not add up in any way. It's complete nonsense. It's a stretch, a a huge stretch. On top of all of the other stretches that this dude has made in this book, I'm simply not buying it. And on top of that, he still hasn't convinced me that Donald Trump is the new Messiah. I'm sorry. Maybe we'll get to that one later in this chapter or in the next one. Wow, he's just doing a long run on sentence. I'm going to start this sentence over. The second tablets of stone made by man represents a son of man, which Jesus referred to in the third person in numerous scriptures in the New Testament, whereas the tablets of God that were broken represent the son of God that was crucified. Huge stretch. This great concealed revelation between the two different sets of tablets of stone is an absolute parable of the son of man and the son of God. Yeah, I don't think he knows what a parable is. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. I'll even give you this one. Didn't have to be told by Jesus. Okay, maybe a parable is just a a basic moral lesson, uh, a story that conveys a moral lesson. This isn't a parable. This is a parallel. But okay, whatever. I'm not going to go to nitpick town here. Let's keep reading. Jesus said numerous times that after him, the Son of Man would come. The Son of Man is somebody else, and he is not Jesus. You notice he didn't actually give us any verses that say that Jesus claimed the Son of Man would come after him, because those verses don't exist. The Son of Man is somebody else, and he is not Jesus, as the Christian church claims he is. Jesus was correct when he said that Moses wrote about him according to John 4, 50, uh, I'm sorry, according to John 5, 46. Moses wrote about Jesus as the Son of God, as the... Uh, as the tablets of God, and Moses also wrote about the Son of Man as the tablets of man. Yeah, this is just complete nonsense. It's a total stretch. The people and disciples were asking Jesus in John 12, 34, and 35, who is the Son of Man, whom Jesus is referring to in the third person? Okay, I, I'm not sure. I haven't read John 12, 34, but I'm assuming that this is the John 
version of the Mark 8 where he called the crowd over to talk about the Son of Man, uh, like we talked about just a minute ago. These people who were with Jesus wanted to know who is this Son of Man whom Jesus referred to in the third person numerous times and who would come after him. Yeah, again, I don't remember Jesus saying the Son of Man would come after Jesus. What? The people wanted to know from Jesus the real identity of the Son of Man according to John 12, 34. What is noticeable is in verse John 12, 35, is that Jesus never responded to them, pointing out directly who the Son of Man was. All right, let's look at this one. John 12, 34 and 35. It says, The crowd spoke up, We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Uh, by the way, if a, if a story is in the book of John, but not in the book of Matthew, Mark, or Luke, it's probably fake. It was probably added hundreds of years later by uh, hundreds of years later by monks because we have a billion examples of that happening in the book of John. It was written way after the other gospels by somebody who had never met Jesus, didn't know Jesus, didn't even know the people who claimed to have known Jesus. The book of John is not trustworthy at all. If you want the stories about Jesus, go to the other gospels. But anyway, then Jesus told them, "You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you." Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Okay, that doesn't say that Jesus claimed the Son of Man was somebody other than him and that he would come after Jesus died or any of that stuff. What is this guy even talking about? He's citing verses to back up his beliefs when these verses absolutely do not support what he says at all. This is bizarre. These people who were with Jesus wanted to know who is the Son of Man whom Jesus referred to in the third person numerous times and who would come after him. The people wanted to know from Jesus the real identity of the Son of Man according to John 12, 34. What is noticeable is that in verse 12, 35, that Jesus never responded to them, pointing out directly who the Son of Man was. Right, so Jesus did not tell the people, I am the Son of Man, because that's a pretty tall claim. You come around and claim that you are the Messiah. It's a quick way to get nailed on a cross and stabbed with a spear. That's a quick way to get that to happen. Of course, Jesus wasn't ready to tell them that he was the Messiah. That is like a deep blasphemy, if not true, right? And the Jewish people at the time were pretty sensitive to blasphemy. Of course, Jesus beat around the bush and didn't exactly come out and say it. He did tell his disciples that he believed that he was the son of man, or at least strongly hinted at it. But it's no surprise that he didn't come out and tell a giant crowd of people yet that he believed that. Of course he didn't. This guy is just grasping at straws. It's ridiculous. Jesus has kept it a secret from them who the son of man was that would come after Jesus. Jesus made numerous statements written in the four gospels that the son of man would come after him who is the son of God. No, he didn't. After he says that in this book, he then quotes John 12, 34 to 35, what we just read. Jesus does not say the Son of Man will come after him. What is he even talking about? In the scriptures cited here below, you will see that Jesus, his disciples, and even the demons have said that Jesus is the Son of God, according to Matthew 4, 3 to 6, or 3 and 6, yeah. He feels like he has established that there is a difference between the Son of God and the Son of Man. I'm not comfortable saying that at all. And if he can prove that Jesus is the Son of God, then he can prove that he's not the Son of Man, I guess, in his mind. I simply disagree. Jesus, the Son of God, who was bruised, broken, and crucified according to the four Gospels in the New Testament, has a direct parallel to the tablets of God that were broken and destroyed at the foot of Mount Horeb according to Exodus. It is essential to have knowledge of the Torah, the five books of Moses, so that you can appreciate the deeper secrets thereof and can understand the prophecies, Psalm, and the parables of Jesus in the four Gospels. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, so he's saying you need to understand Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, basically. If you don't understand those books in their original context and their original language, then you won't be able to come to the conclusion that Donald Trump is the son of man. <laughs> okay. Absent the acquaintance of the Torah of Moses, you will not perceive the bottomless mythology and secrets behind these two monarchies of heaven and earth, which are written about in hidden codes throughout the entire Hebrew scripture. Hidden codes, you say? Fantastic. Okay. More Bible code stuff. Like I said, Ken Hoven believes in Bible code heavily and talks about it fairly frequently. It's complete nonsense. 
So now I guess he's quoting John 10:34 to 36. He says, "In John 10:34 to 36, Jesus identified himself as the Son of God. What is remarkable is how Jesus has mentioned numerous times in the third person that the Son of Man will come after him, who is the Son of God." Okay, he's already said this like 16 times. There are two individual sons, the Son of God and then the other one, the Son of Man. Now, I simply disagree, and so do Bible scholars. This guy is not a Bible scholar. Honestly, has no idea what he's talking about. I'm going to defer to the Bible scholars rather than this guy because he's already proven himself to be willing to twist things around to be more to his liking and advantage. Studying these Greek scriptures, you will see that Jesus mentioned the Son of Man in the third person numerous times and that Jesus was talking about someone else and not himself as the Christian church claims. Seriously, he's said this like 16 times already. You, I got it. Get, get to the point. It is written in the four Gospels of the New Testament that the Son of Man will follow Jesus, according to Matthew 10, 23, Matthew 28, so on and so forth. Uh, once again, just completely made up. He is cherry-picking verses and making claims about them that simply aren't even in there. Notice how Jesus, the Son of God, referred to the Son of Man in the third person in the scriptures below. Uh, this one is a quote from Matthew 12, 8. Like, we read a lot of these already, so I'm not even going to bother. G uh, this is the next page of the book. Jesus has made it noticeably clear that there are two individual sons which are parallel to the two sets of tablets of stone. Again, he already said this. Why is he repeating himself for like the 16th time? The parallel is that the tablets of God are the son of God and the tablets of man are the son of man. This, this is a huge stretch. Any reason to believe this at all? These two sons are congruent with the two sets of tablets of stone in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy mentioned by Moses. These two sons correspond with the two bridegrooms in the, in the New Testament, and they are mentioned in various ways throughout the entire Bible. The Son of God represents Messiah ben Yosef, where the Son of Man represents Messiah, uh, Messiah ben David. The Son of God represents a pillar of cloud, whereas the Son of Man represents a pillar of fire, red. Okay, I'm not picking that up from anything that he said so far. It seems like he's just asserting this shit blindly. The Son of God represents the snake in the Garden of Eden. What? Whereas the Son of Man represents the tree of life. Oh my God, dude. The Son of God represents the snake in the Garden of Eden. Whereas the Son of Man represents the tree of life. This is fascinating. Oh my God, what a crazy claim. What does that mean? Is he saying the Son of God is like Satan? Weird. The Son of God represents a pillar of cloud, whereas the Son of Man represents a pillar of fire. He already said that. Why is he repeating himself over and over and over again? Oh, no. Oh, no. The pillar of man... I'm sorry. The pillar represents a penis, male, and the pillar of cloud makes the pillar of fire significantly two male figures or two snakes. Oh, shit. Now we're entering crazy town, as if we hadn't already. Oh, God, this is nuts. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> These two pillars signify the two trees in the Garden of Eden, the, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The pillar of fire, fire is red, represents Esau, the red one, whereas the pillar of cloud represents Jacob. The son of man is the pillar of fire, whereas the son of God is a pillar of cloud. All right, so let me explain what he's doing here. He's He's linking things together that don't belong together. So he says the pillar of fire represents Esau. The reason he says that is because Esau had red hair. That, that's the only connection between the two. There's no other reason to link them together. The guy's just going through a list of things that he thinks are similar and claiming that this means that Trump is the son of man. It's nuts. No basis in reality whatsoever. Your boy is repressed, pretty sure, right? Exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's getting crazy. Uh, I believe Esau famously had red hair. Yeah, that that's the connection between, I, I think, that's the connection between the pillar of fire and Esau, and that's why they're claiming that Esau is the blah, 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 whatever else. Yeah, it, this is all garbled nonsense. It, it doesn't, like, it's not connected to reality at all. The pillar represents a snake or a penis. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to censor these out. Jesus makes mention of two snake gods. The Son of Man is a snake god, according to John 3.14, that needs to be lifted up, according to John 12.34, whereas Jesus, the Son of God, is also a snake god, according to John 13.18 and Genesis 3.15. 
Jesus is the snake god that was crucified on the tree. The prophet Isaiah is speaking about the two snakes according to Isaiah 27.1, the Leviathan, the piercing serpent, and the, Leviathan, and the Leviathan, the crooked serpent. Please read my chapter, The God of the Dead and the God of the Living, where I explain that Jesus, who is the Son of God, is the snake god mythology in my book, The Five Gods of the Bible. Wow! Most Christians claim that the snake from the Garden of Eden was Satan, even though there was no concept for Satan at the time when it was written. The Jewish religion didn't have a, a Satan in their mythology. Satan didn't come along as a religious figure until like hundreds of years later, like long, long after those books were written, thousands of years even. So th that's my argument for the fact that the snake in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, was not Satan. It was just a snake. And as punishment for convincing Adam and Eve to eat the fruit, God took their legs away and made them crawl on their belly all their days, right? But he's claiming that the snake was Jesus, fascinatingly. Not that the snake was Satan, that it was Jesus. Wow, this is wild. The caduceus, I've never heard this word before. I hope it's not another slur like he... He used slurs a bunch of times in his intro, and I didn't even know they were slurs because I'd never heard of them before. They're like South African slurs, and I said the word a whole bunch. I'm really hoping this one isn't one of those. The caduceus, herald's wand or staff, is the staff carried by Hermes in Greek mythology, and consequently by Hermes Trismegistus in Greco-Egyptian mythology. The same staff is also borne by heralds in general. For example, by Iris, the messenger of Hera. It's a short staff entwined with two serpents, sometimes surmounted by wings. In Roman iconography, it was depicted as being carried in the left hand of Mercury, the messenger of the gods, guide of the dead, and protector of merchants, shepherds, gamblers, liars, and thieves. So I think he's trying to tie Greek mythology in with the book of Genesis and the, the, the story of the snake. So he believes that he's established that Jesus was the snake from the Garden of Eden. And now he's trying to tie Greek mythology into that. Some accounts suggest that the oldest known imagery of the Caduceus, I think Caduceus, has roots of Mesopotamian origin with the Sumerian god Ningashida, whose symbol, a staff with two snakes intertwined around it, dates to 4000 BC to 3000 BC. The oldest known representation of two snakes entwined around a rod is that of the Sumerian fertility god, Ningashida, I think is how it's said. Probably wrong. Forgive me, Ningashida, for mispronouncing your name. Ningashida was sometimes depicted as a serpent with a human head, eventually becoming a god of healing and magic. It is a companion of Dumuzi, or Tammuz, with whom it stood at the gate of heaven. There are plenty of errors that these gospel preachers made in the four gospels of the New Testament because of confusion between these two sons. These mistakes should be corrected due to what Moses has written about the tablets of God and the tablets of man according to Exodus. Wow, okay. So let me explain what he just concluded here. Since Moses came down from the mountain with tablets, and then they fell and broke, and then he went back up and got another set, and brought them down, that establishes that there will be two messiahs, the Son of God and the Son of Man. How he got there from here? You got me. You got me. But since he's established that idea in his head, he believes that the gospel writers of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John got it wrong in what they wrote. He's using this as a pretext to justify changing the gospels changing the books in the Bible to closer reflect his belief that the Son of Man and the Son of God are two different beings. This is actually absolutely fascinating to me. Wow, man, this is, this is wild. Like, the logical leaps this guy takes are something else. The four acknowledged Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were possibly written between A.D. 66 and 110. That's fair. I would say that's probably pretty accurate. I think John may have been written a little bit later than that. Building on older sources and traditions, and each gospel has its own characteristic understanding of Jesus and his godly character. Mark was written first, and then 
Matthew and Luke were written based off of Mark, I believe. I'm not a Bible scholar, so take it with a grain of salt. And John was then based off of the rest, from my understanding. Again, I could be wrong, but I think that's the order that they were written. All four are anonymous. The recent names were added in the second century, and it's almost certain that none were written by an eyewitness. Correct. They are the key foundation of material on the life of Jesus as searched for in the quest of the historical Jesus. Modern scholars typically trust them unquestioningly, but critical study attempts to differentiate the original ideas of Jesus from those of the later authors. Many non-canonical gospels were also written, all later than the four, and all like them advocating the theological opinions of their authors. Wow, it was really interesting, this whole chapter. Like, he espoused some absolutely off-the-hinges stuff in this chapter. That is completely nutty, but really, really interesting. Uh, the next chapter, chapter three, is Messiah ben Yosef and Messiah ben David. I... I'm really wondering when he's going to try to establish that Trump is the next Messiah. I couldn't even guess. Maybe it's chapter 11. I don't know, but this is nutty stuff, dude. Let me know what you think of this in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist.